Job chapter 19 over in your Old Testament. Job is just before the Psalms. Very, very easy book to find. And we are in the 19th chapter today as we continue to march through our sermon series from the book of Job, which has been a huge blessing to me so far. I have really enjoyed preaching from this book because it's so very, very, very unique. But I've really enjoyed hearing the feedback as these concepts have been catching on in your heart. Uh, I, I knew this was something that the Lord wanted me to preach, but I was I was telling Kathy and Rolf earlier in Sunday school, I said, you know, long about the end of November or early December, I began to sense in my heart that the Lord wanted me to preach on Job in January. And it was one of those times I kind of, I kind of, I, I, I questioned what the Lord was telling me. I said, I'm just not sure this will be an enjoyable sermon series to get in Job and to get into all this misery and the sores and the problems and the things that came upon Job. Surely it will be very, very difficult to preach, but that's not been the case. I have very much enjoyed looking into the book of Job with you. And last week we took a look at Job's integrity and how Satan tried to tear down the consistency and the backbone and the moral fiber that Job had by coming against him with all kinds of all kinds of issues that started with the loss of property and loss of money and loss of livestock and then the loss of all of his children. All ten of them in one day died. And then as if that wasn't enough, Satan came back around and said, well, we're going to put sores on him. And let's, let's disease his body, and then we will see whether Job will give up his faith and curse the Lord. And so he was afflicted, it says, with sores all over his body that were very, very awful to the extent that you couldn't recognize that it was Job. His best friends in the world didn't know him when they came up on him. And, and still, after all of this happened to Job, you know, he did not lose his faith. You know, Satan brought a beating against this guy the likes of which you and I hope to never ever see and never ever go through, and he would not curse God. You know, his response in all of that was, I, I came naked into this world, I will go out the same way, I can take nothing with me. The Lord gave, the Lord took away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. And so he, he, hold on, he held on to his integrity as a believer, even when he couldn't understand Man, why is all this stuff, why has all this bad happened to me? And it turns out that it was a test. It was a test. Now, if you'll read the book of Job, there's not a whole lot of story to it. In fact, most of it is this dialogue between Job and his friends. And, and they all had ideas about why the calamities had happened to Job. They, they, one of them told him, they said, now, Job, we know you, you, you've got to have sinned is the reason this came upon you now. You're going to figure out what it is that you did that angered God, and you're going to have to repent of it, and then all, this, all these problems will leave you. But that wasn't true. The Scripture says that Job hadn't sinned and brought all this misery upon himself, that instead this was <coughs> Satan's way of trying to, trying to tear the man of God apart. So his friends gave him some bad advice. <laughs> and even, even his wife, you may remember from last week, came to him and she said, Curse God and die. I mean, I, I can't stand to see you go on in this kind of misery anymore. So the suffering that fell on Job was profound, profound. But he reaches some conclusions in the midst of the suffering and in the midst of the problems. And I think that we can come to these same kind of conclusions when we go through suffering and when we have issues in life. And I, I, would, I would almost guarantee, and in fact, I know some of you are going through trials right now, that you wonder, why am I going through this? What has happened that brought these problems into my life? And so I hope this word this morning will be very encouraging to you, and that you'll see that some of the conclusions Job reached, you can reach as well when you are in trials and don't understand why, and when bad things fall on good people, and we have all these questions as to why the good suffer. And it seems sometimes that the evildoer goes on and gets blessed. <laughs> and it's real easy to look and say, well, where is God in the midst of all of my pain? Where is God when I suffer? And I've been there because I'm human. And I bet you've been there because you're human. <laughs> Amen. 
To, to live in this world is going to bring you some suffering. It's going to bring you some heartache. It's going to bring you some problems. Jesus guaranteed it. He said, in this world you will find trials of all sorts, but be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. So we're going to be in Job 19. Job here, he replies to his friends who have been giving him lousy advice. <laughs> in fact, there in verse 2, it says he answered, he said, how long will you torment me? And break me in pieces with words. These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. So Job, it, you can tell that he has a tone of why me? You know, you, you can tell that he still has questions about his suffering. But later on in this chapter, he reaches a conclusion that shows me that you can really hear from God well sometimes when you're going through a struggle. Have you experienced that? Have you ever had a struggle that drew you closer to the Lord because it was too big for you to handle? And, and whether in desperation or in faith or whatever, you turn to God and you found that your faith was even more rock solid once it was put to the test. Well, that's what Job discovered too. Read with me here in verse 23. Job 19, 23. And I think I'll have you on shouting ground here in just a minute. Verse 23 says, Oh, that my words were written. <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? Because they are, right? Here we are thousands of years later reading Job's words. He says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, Yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. Now that's short and concise, but very, very beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. To think about what Job was seeing. So let's go no further without talking to the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. We're going to need his help to understand the word today. So let's open our hearts and minds to him. Father, we come to you in the sweet name of Jesus today, Lord, and I just want to place myself in your mighty hands, Lord, humbly admitting that I have nothing to bring, Lord, but you have everything for your people this morning. So I pray that I might be emptied, Lord, and that you would fill me and speak through me and use me in this hour, Father. And I pray that in our hearts and in our minds, we can just swing wide open the doors to you and say, Lord, come in. Please teach me. Please change my life. Teach me to suffer with integrity. Teach me to see the future, my future with you and how blessed it is. And Father, I thank you for every person who is in church today. I pray that you will bring uh, a, a brand new appreciation, Father, of who you are through the word this morning. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs> So Job said, oh, that my words were written. <laughs> oh, that this was in a book somewhere. Isn't that cool? See, he's saying it aloud, right? Not knowing that a long time later down the road, you and I would get a chance to read his words. And, and what were these words, these powerful words that he said, I, I really wish these were set down. I really wish somebody would write this because I feel like maybe this is coming from God and something good's going to come out of here. He says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And they are. They're in your Holy Bible. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead that they were engraved in the rock forever. He says, I've, I've, I've come to a conclusion. I've, I've come to a conclusion that is going to be a help to people in suffering. That if we can reach this point, we might can see a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's where he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. Now we've got we've got several songs that, that use this, don't we, as, as as a text, and that have came from this really really beautiful passage. But to understand what's going on here, you have to think, you know, as Job would have in the ancient world back in Bible times, 
He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. Now, I, I hope it's clear to you here, church, that God was revealing some things to this guy. There were some things coming out of Job as he spoke here that had to have been revealed by the Spirit of God, had to have been revealed by God himself, because Job simply couldn't have known it. And from, from his mouth comes a little bit of prophecy, in other words, and the Lord says something profound. He says, I, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Amen. Well, I know that my Redeemer lives too. Do you know that this morning? Amen. Is your Redeemer alive? His name is Jesus, isn't he? And Job couldn't have known that. Job, living a long time before Christ, he could not have known who the Redeemer was going to be or what he would be like. See, we live in the best times, church. We're living in the time after the cross and before the second coming of Jesus. And living in this time means that you can be saved because of what Jesus has done on the cross. That's my Redeemer hanging up there, right? And Job, he couldn't have known that if God hadn't shown him that, that down in, distantly through the ages that there was going to be a Redeemer. But his statement is so true. you got to understand how profound it is when he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, Jesus hadn't even physically been born yet at that time. The Christmas story, him being born in the manger, born to Mary, all those things, had not occurred. And yet, he could say, couldn't he, and, and, and it'd be true, my Redeemer lives. Because do you know, church, I want you to know that your Redeemer was alive in the days of Job as well. Amen. That before Jesus became flesh and walked among us, he was alive at that point too. There wasn't a day when he was suddenly created or when, when God made him. The scripture tells us that he was the living word and that word was with God in the very beginning. Right. So for Job to say my redeemer lives is not a statement that says Jesus is, is, is on the, 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 the earth today at the time of Job. No, he says my redeemer is alive and he always has been alive and he's always going to be alive because church there's never a day you can make that statement and it is not true no. my redeemer is alive right now yes. and he is seated at God's mighty right hand and he's not going to stay there forever he's got more to come for us brethren but you know if I would lived in the time of Job I could have said then too I know that my redeemer lives because he's alive then as well Remember what Jesus told the Pharisees? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. There was never a moment Jesus wasn't. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. He's there all the time. Now, uh, what, I'm, what I'm hitting you with is a key piece of theology. That you have to realize that Jesus and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit were with one another and working and alive and, and, and involved uh, from time immemorial. There wasn't a time when Jesus appeared. So Job, and it must have been God speaking to him, Job is coming up with some profound truth. He says, whoo, there's a Redeemer coming, and he's alive even today. <laughs> Amen. He says, he's going to be my Redeemer, not somebody else's Redeemer, not just the Redeemer. He's mine. He's my Redeemer, and I know that he lives. And what's he going to do, church? Verse 25 says, at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Now, again, from Job's perspective, you could say, well, yeah, Job lived before the time of Jesus. Sure, pastor, that's pretty obvious. And he says, okay, at the last, he will stand on the earth. That came true, amen? It did come true. Jesus' feet our Redeemer's feet literally and physically stood on this earth. Praise the Lord. Amen. He did come, physically was here, but there's a key word in here, at the last. See, Job just wasn't seen to the time of Jesus. Job was looking on out through history and was talking about the very end of all things too. 
He said, at the last, at the last, I know who is still going to be standing. I know who is still going to be alive. I know that though the devil rages and brings all kinds of trouble and problems against everybody, I know that at the last, my Redeemer is the one who is going to win the war, brethren. I know that at the last, his feet will stand on this earth again because Jesus is going to return. So when he says, I know my Redeemer lives and at the last he will stand on the earth, sure, he's looking at, at, at the physical ministry of Jesus, but I believe he was also looking forward to the end times and saying there is coming a day that is going to be the last one. Do you know it? I mean, people try to tell you that this world's just going to go on and on forever, but brethren, there is a day that will be the last day. And even Job in his time, and this must have been the Spirit revealing to him, he said, on that day, I know that my Redeemer, who's alive even in my times, in that day, he will at last stand upon the earth. And you know, the scripture tells us he will do just that. That when Jesus returns, he's going to return in the same way he left. Remember how he left? Took off into the sky and the clouds obscured him. Well, the scripture says he will return with clouds and he will descend just like he ascended in that day. He's going to descend, brother, and he is going to plant his feet right here on earth where he's going to rule and reign forevermore. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to a time when sin is wiped out, when pain is gone, when sickness and sorrow are destroyed at last, when Satan is finally gone and gets what's coming to him, this, I know this will excite you because I've been excited all week just thinking about it, that Job had that revealed to him so excitingly by God that there is coming a day that'll be the last one. And on that day, I know who's gonna be still standing. The devil will come against him with everything he's got and will not destroy my Redeemer. Because my Redeemer lives. That'll be a true statement on that day, won't it? It was a true statement in Job's time. And it's a true statement today that my Redeemer is living at this very moment, church. And on the earth again, he shall stand. That'll be the last day. And Job says, boy, I'm looking forward. <laughs> and I know when you suffer, that's sometimes that's the thing you look forward to the most. You say, come quickly, Lord. This world is so broke and so messed up and so tore up by sin and by the devil and his ways. I can't wait to the day when the, when the feet of the Lord at last stand on the earth again. Amen. Praise God. Now, if the, if, the, if the return of Jesus scares you, you might have a little problem in your heart that needs solved because that's supposed to be something we can look forward to if we are believers. So check your heart this morning. He says, I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And brethren, you've got to go on with me right here. I, I, know, you've, I know you've made the journey so far, but we're going to take a, a theological jump right here. You've got to be ready in verse 26. It says, after my skin has been thus destroyed. Yet in my flesh, I shall see God. Amen. Amen. Y'all want to see God? Amen. Yeah, it, it's okay to want to see God. Now you can currently. Scripture tells us Moses got to see just a, just a, just a little bit of, of God and his radiance. And you know what it did. It, cha it, it changed Moses forever. And sinful flesh and blood people cannot fully behold the face of Almighty God. He's too powerful for us. It, it just wiped you out where you stand. I guess we would disintegrate or something. That's how powerful the, the Lord is. But I do want to see him. And the scripture tells us that someday in his kingdom, after this flesh has been destroyed, that there will come a day, brethren, when we will get to behold the Lord. 
Now, you can't do it in your current flesh, <laughs> again, because sin has made it where we can't. We can't stand up to the, the radiance of who God is. But Job had reached a profound conclusion. In verse 26, he says, after my skin has been destroyed, after this body is gone, after I have died physical death, Look what he says. Yet in my flesh I shall see God. Now how can a man see God in his flesh if he's already proclaimed that this will happen after my flesh has been destroyed? Because Job is talking about the resurrection, brethren. Yeah. Now it's, it'll amaze you when you get a hold of it to realize that this guy lived so far earlier than Jesus is coming. And yet he could say, I know that when this skin is gone, when this flesh has died, when they put me in the ground, when they bury me, that after that, I will see God in the flesh. Absolutely. How am I going to see him, brother? I, I've been up here preaching that you can't see him in your physical body right now because at the resurrection, God is going to redeem all these bodies and transform them. Yeah, we hear we hear about the dead in Christ rising. And I, ho I hope you don't picture that as, as they'll be decayed or something. When God raises the dead, they'll be raised <laughs> immortal. When God raises the dead, this corruptible flesh that we see going out of commission before our very eyes, on every day of our life we see the slow decline, it will be no more. Because God's going to give you a new glorified body that you will live in his kingdom in. And it will be like the body of Jesus after he came out of the grave. The scripture says he's the first fruits from the dead, but then the rest of us are going to come too. And that's how Job could make that statement. You see, you see what was being revealed to him? This is, in, and this is incredible stuff. He says, after this skin is destroyed, in my flesh, and he's talking about that new flesh, that redeemed flesh, <laughs> that kingdom body, that glorified body, he says, in that I will see God with my very eyes. I'm going to look right at him. I know you've imagined that, haven't you? You ever think about heaven and you ever think about what it will be to see God? what he looks like. <laughs> Job says, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it after this flesh is gone, but still in the flesh. See, Job knew, I'm going to die a physical death, but there'll come a day that God is going to resurrect the saints. He was seeing into the future, brother, in a way that is hard to even comprehend. This is doctrine that didn't develop even until later on as the Apostle Paul helped, helped everybody start to understand it. Job was seeing it all the way back then. Why could Job see so clearly what was going to happen in the future? He says in verse 27, I shall see him for myself. You like to see things for yourself? <laughs> This is the show me state, amen? You're going to have to show me. i got to look at it. i got to look at it with my eyes. That's what we're famous for down here. He says, I will see for myself, but I shall behold and not another. He said, this won't be some second-hand account, brethren. You, Christian, will see God with your very own eyes someday. Amen. Your Redeemer, he's alive. You can destroy this flesh and bury it in the ground and I've still got a day with destiny because yeah. God is going to resurrect me and I am going to look on him and no one's going to do it for me. Oh yeah. You know, you watch on the news, you get eyewitness accounts, etc. But there's no substitute for being there. Amen? Amen? That's like trying to describe the ocean to somebody and what it feels like to stand on the shore and look at the sea. Or if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, or been up on top of Pikes Peak or any of these wonderful places we can go in our world, you try to describe to people, don't you? <coughs> I, I, I remember seeing the Grand Canyon when I was seven or eight years old. 
and being so overwhelmed by the grandness of it. And then you come home and you say, well, I saw the Grand Canyon. Boy, it was something else. What was it like? Well, it's a huge hole. <laughs> right? I mean, how else can you describe that? I mean, there's, there's no putting into words. you got to be there to see with your own eyes. Well, there won't be any description, brother, of what it will be to look at Almighty God. But, I, but I'm here to tell those of you who believe, those of you who are saved this morning, you're going to see him. If Job could make that statement, I promise you, you can make that statement more. Because you're living in the time past the cross. You're more redeemed than Job was redeemed on that day. And look at the knowledge that he was receiving. Now there's a point to all of this. The point has been to excite you and to encourage you in your faith, yes. But I wanted to point out that all of this knowledge came to Job at the worst time in his life. Lucky Job. Lucky Job, amen. amen. <laughs> but wait, not lucky Job, right? Because I mean, he lost all this stuff. But he, he had revelation from God in his suffering that is almost too big to put into words. Now, when we suffer, Sometimes the purpose is to drive us closer to the Lord. And many of us would say, well, how about I just stay distant from the Lord and not ever have any trouble? <laughs> you know? But that's not God's program for you if you're a Christian. He's always bringing you steps further in your faith. And it could be that there was a moment where God needed to move you closer to him and knew that it would, that it would take trouble to get you there. Can you accept that? Can you say, all right, I don't want to sign on for any trouble, but if God can reveal himself to me further through trouble, I'll take what God wants to send me. Can you be that kind of believer? That's the question. See, Job didn't want all that trouble either, but because he went through it, God showed him the most amazing things. God had Job in knowledge of what was going to go on in the resurrection, the second coming of Christ, all these things. Where did he get that knowledge? He got it from God in the midst of his suffering. So maybe we need to be not so fast to try to want to scoot out from under suffering when it comes. But instead say, what does God want to teach me? What is the message here that I'm needing to receive? Now, your human mind is going to tell you that you're shallow. Your human mind is going to say, oh yeah, there you go, clinging to God again when times get tough. Oh boy, aren't you a good Christian. My brain says the same thing to me, brethren. Every time. Hard, something hard hits me in life, and it drives me closer to the Lord. I always feel a little ashamed that something bad had to happen to me for God to get my attention. But it's happened to me several times in life. And I'm happy to say that God is not done with any of us in this room today. Do you know it? God is not done with you. Whatever you've learned of him, however far you've came, however much of this winding steep road you've managed to conquer so far, he's not done with you. I'm glad, but it sounds a little scary, doesn't it? God's not done with me. What, preacher? You mean to say something, something bad's going to happen to you? Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe something bad is about to happen to you. But the bad thing turned into the good thing because of Job's faith. And it's your faith that can redeem your situation that you find yourself in. You say, I don't like where I'm at. I wish I could wave a magic wand and change these people or change what's going on. I wish I could fix things instantly. I don't like being in trouble. But can we at least, church, say, God, if your design is to bring me closer to you, then let me get just as close to you as I possibly can get. Let's learn the lesson. Let's receive the revelation that he wants to give in that suffering. Let's let him teach us through problems and through good times. Can you love God that much that you trust him 
When things are going good and when they're going bad? Yes, you can. And that's what we must do, brethren. Amen. Now, I wonder what he'll show you. He showed that to Job. <laughs> that was profound. I wonder what God will show you in your problem. I wonder what knowledge God wants to impart to your brain. What is he speaking to your spirit that you have endured what you have endured? It's a powerful thought. And it changes poor little old me into a worshiper who says, all right, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to be his man. I'm going to hold on to my integrity. The devil can use me as a punching bag, but I'm still going to love this redeemer. I know that he lives. I know that someday on the earth he is going to stand again. And I know that with my own two eyes, not somebody else's second account, with my own two eyes, I am going to behold him. Brethren, that kind of faith will take you through so much hardship. Amen. That kind of faith will buoy you through the dark and deep waters. That kind of faith will keep you shielded from the fire that you are having to walk through. If you are in a trial today and you are holding on with that gritty, gutsy faith that says, I will not let go of the hand of my Savior, you're doing the right thing. Amen. Don't let your brain tell you different. Don't let the world tell you different. Don't let friends tell you different or even loved ones. Your walk with God is going somewhere even when you can't understand the end result. Amen. God's doing something in your life. I can't wait to see. Maybe he's going to impart some kind of knowledge that, <laughs> that would give Job a run for his money. But verse 27, he says, I'm, I'm going to see him for myself. My eyes shall behold and not another. And look at his conclusion. My heart faints within me. I think that's the Old Testament version of my mind is blown. <laughs> my heart faints with me. He says, I, I can't even begin to comprehend the love God has for me. And it blows my mind to think about how good God is and his overall program or what he's doing on this world is so very, very marvelous that who am I to question it because I suffer for a little bit. We hold on to our faith and in that suffering, who knows, we might receive some powerful revelation. God may be toughening us up for something that he has for us down the road, but Christian, be of good cheer. If you're walking with Jesus, he has already promised you that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. I don't care how alone you feel sometimes, he's there. He's there. And you know what he said? He said, be of good courage, be of good courage, and I will strengthen your heart. It takes a little bit of human courage, but then God gives the rest of the strength. Whatever you're going through this morning, it is going to turn out for the good. And you're going to turn around and look and you're going to say, my heart faints within me. <laughs> you're going to say, God just blew my mind how he got me out of this one and how he's working in my life. And he is truly, truly wonderful. Amen, church. Amen. Praise the Lord that our Redeemer lives. We're going to close with a song at this time.